Moshe and the Makalo. One is the greatest prophet of all time, and the other is an anonymous man known only for cursing God. It's not the likeliest duo. And yet, the Torah links these men together. Hi, I'm Imu Shalev, and this is A Book Like No Other. A Book Like No Other is a product of Aleph Beta and made possible through the very generous support of Shari and Nathan Lindenbaum. As we saw last time, there are a whole bunch of intertextual parallels between the story of the Makalel in Leviticus and Moshe's coming-of-age story in the second chapter of Exodus. And let's just, like, replay the highlights reel. Here we go. Both Moshe and the Makalel come from mixed Egyptian-Israelite backgrounds. Both men begin their stories with the word vayetze, with going out. Plus, both stories feature fights. And... Both stories use the rare verb natsa to describe that fighting, and the rare term ishmitsri to describe one of the fighters. These connections are pretty undeniable, and I was really excited to get into them further with Rabbi Foreman, which is what we're going to do this episode. But there was more to it than just my general curiosity. There's a lot riding on the meaning of these connections. Above all, we were hoping that they would give us insight into the strange midrash that we'd seen. You know, the Medrash that the Makalel cursed God because he wasn't allowed to pitch his tent in the camp, and that even Moshe just ruled against the Makalel, kind of coldly leaving him totally disenfranchised? What's problematic about that backstory is that it paints Moshe in a bad light, while also highlighting our sympathy for the Makalel. And that made it really difficult to understand why God ultimately punishes the Makalel with death by stoning. What moral does the Torah want us to learn from all this? Justice be done and that's all that matters? So as we flipped open our Tanakhs to Exodus, the stakes were higher than our typical text study hangout. Could something in Exodus, something about Moshe's experience as a young prince, bring clarity to the messy, dark tale of the Makalel? Let's find out. So what to make of these Exodus and Leviticus parallels? Well, to start, Rabbi Foreman actually had one last parallel to show me. And this was a good one. Just to set this up for you, we're going to start in Exodus. Again, this is chapter 2. Remember, Moshe's story begins with him going out and seeing an Ish Mitzri, an Egyptian man. And the Egyptian is beating a Hebrew slave. So what he does is he intervenes and he kills the Egyptian. That's the first fight. But then... Moshe goes out again the next day and sees a second fight. And here's where we find our new parallel with the Makalel. Fight number two, there's these two Jews that are fighting with one another. And what does Moshe try to do? Moshe doesn't want to kill the aggressor. He intervenes in a different way this time. And he says, Hey, what are you doing hitting your friend? And what does the aggressor say back to Moshe? He seems to reject Moshe's standing entirely. He says, Mi samcha le'ish sar aleinu, who has placed you as a man, a, a minister and judge above us. You have no standing to judge us. And then he says, Halahargeni ata omer what are you going to do? Kill me the same way you killed yesterday's Egyptian? Take a look at Rashi and Shmot on Pasuk Yagimel. Halahargeni ata omer, are you saying to kill me? The Medrash is bothered by that language, halahargeni ata omer. The way the Medrash understands it, it doesn't just mean, are you saying that you will kill me? It's, are you saying to kill me? In other words, would you kill me with your words? Mikan analumedim, from there we learn, shahargo, that when Moshe killed the Ishmitzri, he killed him, b'shem hamiforash, with God's name. He killed him with words. <laughs> he killed him with God's name. Yeah. Oh, so we have Moshe uttering the name of God. In a story of struggle. In a story of struggle. Now turn to Rashi and Vayikra and look at the blasphemy. Rashi, Vayikra 2411. Vayikov, when he curses, Uparish, and he specifies the name. What name does he specify? Shenakav Shem Hamiyuchad Vigidev. Vahu. Shem HaMaforash. Mm. It's the mm-hmm. same name. 
And the Medrash is saying that's the name Moshe uses to kill the Mitzri. That's the name that the Makalo uses to curse God. So my initial reaction to seeing this parallel was like, wow, the sages are seeing these stories as intimately connected in a way that I never would have seen. The text seems to be hinting to Moshe using speech as a kind of weapon. And then the sages fill in the rest for us. What could that weapon possibly be? The name of God. And I think that's really, really cool. But on the other hand, if we're to take that parallel seriously, it left me confused. Because the Makalal uses God's name to curse God, and Moshe uses God's name to kill someone. These uses are far from parallel. They're not the same thing, but they're also, they're not inverses of each other. So what exactly is the relationship between these two usages of God's name? How do they line up in any meaningful way? Now, not surprisingly, Rabbi Foreman had a theory. But to see that theory, we needed to take a step back and dive a little bit into Moshe's backstory. What led him to those fateful outings where he came across these two fights? Now, Moshe's origin story is, of course, a lot more famous than the Makalels. Most of us know the basics. Hebrew male babies were supposed to be drowned, but instead of drowning him, Moshe's mother puts him in a basket and leaves the basket in the Nile. The baby is discovered by the daughter of Pharaoh, and this is how Moshe ends up being raised in the palace. But while the text gives us these details, it's less explicit about what this whole experience was like for Moshe as a person. Or again, why he suddenly leaves the palace and starts mingling among the common folk. So Rabbi Foreman's hunch was that the text did give us a clue to all of this in the form of a strange little repetition. And actually, Rabbi Foreman's hunch was that this repetition would not only explain how Moshe was using God's name compared to the Makalel, but would be our gateway into understanding the meaning behind all of the parallels between these two stories. So to show me what he noticed and its implications, we headed back to the beginning of chapter two, starting from around verse six. This is right after the daughter of Pharaoh rescues baby Moses. Suddenly, Moshe's sister Miriam, who had been watching from a distance the whole time, steps forward and, well, I'll let Rabbi Foreman take over from here. Daughter of Pharaoh sees this crying child on the side of the Nile. Miriam says, can I get a nursemaid to nurse him for you? And the daughter of Pharaoh says, yes, that's an excellent idea, right? And then the daughter of Pharaoh, unaware that Miriam has actually designated a nursemaid who's the mother of the child, promises this disguised mother of the child money to nurse the child for her. Nurse this child for me. I'll pay you. So she goes and she nurses the child. Look at the next verse. And the child grew up. And brings him to the daughter of Pharaoh. And she adopts him as her son. And calls him Moshe because I brought you out from the water. And the very next verse. And it happened in those days. Second Vayigdal, Vayigdal Moshe, and mm. Moshe grew up, Vayetze Alechav. And went out to his brothers. That's our verse, the one that goes on to describe Moshe witnessing the Egyptian beating the slave. Isn't that fascinating? Two verses back to back, Vayigdal, Vayigdal. What do you make of the double Vayigdal? Why is the Torah repeating that word? To answer this question, we began by just looking more closely at the first Vayigdal. Vaigdal Hayeled, the child grew up. And so Yocheved, Moshe's birth mother, brings Moshe to the daughter of Pharaoh. Now, to get to the deeper significance of this phrase, Rabbi Foreman wanted us to consider what this moment might have been like for Yocheved. So you play birth mother for a moment and go back a verse. Here the daughter of Pharaoh doesn't know who you are and says, I'll pay you to nurse this child. How are you feeling? I mean overjoyed. This is something I'm, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to do. I thought he would be dead. I, I never thought I'd see him again. And here I have this child back in my arms. It's the most wonderful thing. My child is back in my arms, but now why is it bittersweet? The fact that I'm being paid to do this yes. means that this is, they just see me as like, I'm functionarily donating breast milk, right? They're not, they don't see me as this. Uh, as a mother. As a mother. 
the whole reason why Pharaoh's daughter has skin in the game is because she wants to be the one who's mommy for this child. So I'm going to give her to you to nurse, but then bring her to mommy. So when I go to bed that night, I realized that there is an end date on my relationship with this child. Yeah. When I wean this child, I surrender her to another mother. This is the last I'll see of him. He's going to have an Egyptian yeah. mother now. Not only will it be another mother, but it'll be another identity. It'll be another yeah. nationality. So Vaidal doesn't just mean that the boy grew up. It means that he was torn away from his mother and she from him. It means that his whole self-identity, his family, his nationality changed. Okay, now go to the second Vayigdal. The Torah uses the same language. So what's the implication with the second Almost Vayigdal? Vayi bayamim ahem, Vayigdal Moshe. And it happened in those days that Moshe grew up. Vayetze alachav. What happened? He goes out to his true brothers. And why? Seemingly, he's been weaned again, this time from the, inf the influence That's of right. his, his adopted mother. That's right. And go back to the bittersweet aspect of becoming mom and having that child. Just as for Yocheved, it was bittersweet. So it was bittersweet for the daughter of Pharaoh. There was an end date, and the daughter of Pharaoh knew it. Why did she know it? Why was he so sure that there would be an end date? that there would be a moment where the relationship would have to take a turn. I don't even know if she was sure of it. I imagine she, what she would try to do is to suppress or, or disconnect him from his identity. As, yeah, she would resist that as much as she could. You would imagine. But there's one thing that won't let her do it, even if she wanted to. Is it his bris? The child is circumcised. Yeah. There will come a time when that child grows up and knows enough to know that that makes him a Hebrew. Yeah. And that's the moment he'll question everything. She had to have known that when she took him yeah. in, that all she could do is have him for a time, but there would be an end date. And at some point she sits him down just before that end date. And maybe she's the one who breaks the news to him and says, you look out that window, right? you see all those slaves? You're actually one of them. And I love you to pieces, but that's where you come from. Those are your brothers. And Moshe, he knows it's true. He sees his bris and he goes out. And that's the end date. So here too, Vaigdal doesn't just mean that the boy grew up. It means that Moshe was torn away from his mother and she from him. It means that his whole self-identity, his family, his nationality changed. But this time, he's not a child being handed from one mother to another, as traumatic as that probably was. This time, he's a young man leaving the home where he thought he belonged. Does that remind you of anyone? If you think about what lies behind the motivation of the Makala, according to the Medrash, this sense that I have no place, and this desperate search for identity, that I just need somewhere to call my home, I just, just tell me where I can be, right? Think about what must have been going on in Moshe's mind in those days. Here's Moshe. He grows up in the palace. He's a prince of Egypt. He is the ultimate made person, the ultimate person whose future is secure. And in a flash, that future becomes insecure. All is not as it seems. That this woman that I've always called my mother, she's an adoptive mother, but I have another side of my lineage. What's it like to be Moshe when Moshe looks out the window and sees that all those people that we used to make fun of in the palace, that I'm one of them, and he rushes out and sees one of this person striking one of that people. It's like the two sides of his heritage are in conflict with each other, and every bone in your body is screaming, who am I? We'd seen all these textual parallels between Moshe's story and the Makalels, even that they both use the name of God during a critical moment. But now we were seeing that at that critical moment, they were both experiencing similar strife. For both these men, their mixed lineage left them not belonging anywhere. So let that sink in for a second. But then it's time to return to our earlier question. Given all this, what does it mean that Moshe killed the Egyptian with the name of God? So I, I was chatting with a friend who was over here for Shabbos and asked me a question. He says, so Rashi says over here that Moshe used the Shem HaMafarosh, this inexplicable name of God, to kill the Mitzri. 
How did you know that name? He was an Egyptian in the palace. He was brought up as an Egyptian. What does that mean? How did he use this, this special name of God to kill the, the Mitzri? What, what would you say to that, Emu? Maybe this is a name that was whispered to him and, and in his uh, unconscious mind and his mother desperately prayed for his survival. An interesting possibility. I hadn't thought of that. Here's another possibility, which maybe dovetails with that. Imagine the change that Moshe is going through right now in how he views these Israelites that are being beaten. How had he viewed these Israelites for the last decade of his life, ever since he was first brought into the palace? What was palace culture like, right? Everyone saw out the window what was happening to these slaves, and they were fine people in the palace. They went to dinner parties. They appreciated the fine things in life. How did they reconcile themselves with this world in which the Israelites are being beaten and killed? They dehumanized the Israelites. They dehumanized them. I wonder if what Moshe is doing is that he's completely rejecting the moral world that he's been brought up with, and he has no other world to go to other than to say, I think there must be a God in the universe. And if there's a God in the universe, then human life is sacred, right? Because we reflect that human life. And therefore, what he did in standing up for the Israelite was standing up for the little piece of God in that Israelite. So in essence, I would say metaphorically, he killed him with the name of God. In other words, his moral vision is so powerful at that moment. What are you doing killing another human being? Saying this is another human being you're killed. You're desecrating God's name in this world. To stand up with that kind of moral vision coming from the palace is something that is so stark and powerful that somehow, by heaven's judgment, the Mitzri just drops dead just by him opening his mouth without him even having to raise a club. Rabbi Foreman's theory here is a little speculative. I think it's insightful into the type of faith that Moshe likely needed in order for him to stand up to the Egyptian at that moment. And now I could see how Moshe's use of God's name, whether literal or metaphoric, how did it contrast with the Makalel's use of God's name? Moshe was an affirmation of God, and the Makalel's was a terrible sin against God. I really wanted to explore this contrast more. If Moshe and the Makalel were having similar struggles, and they both invoked God's name, but to such different ends, then understanding exactly where their paths diverged seemed essential to understanding the lesson these stories were meant to teach. And spoiler alert, it kind of is. But huh, it's actually a puzzle we'll have to get back to. Because for now, Rabbi Foreman had his eye on another prize, which is seeing how all these Moshe and Mikhail parallels could help us explain the Medrash back in Leviticus. And to get there, we had to finish our read through Moshe's story, starting back at the same verse where we left off, Exodus chapter 2, verse 14. Again, this is right after Moshe tried to intervene in the fight between two Hebrews. And the aggressor says to him, Mi samcha le'ish sar who made you chief and ruler over us? Halahargenia ta'omer, kasher haragta ta'mitzri? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? We just saw how this verse hints to Moshe's use of God's name, but we were about to see how it's hinting to another really important development in this story as well, one that would make Moshe even more akin to the Makala. Now, it always struck me as strange. Who is Moses? Who was Moses just a verse or two ago? He's the prince of Egypt. What are these guys saying? He's literally a crowned prince of Egypt. If there's anybody who's a sarva shofet alenu, anybody who's a prince, why aren't these guys who are two Jews, who are slaves, why aren't they scared for their lives in the face of this Egyptian prince? Especially since almost every Egyptian has the status of a sarva shofet upon a Jew. The Egyptians are a ruling class. And when, in fact, the Israelites are enslaved, that language of sar comes back. There were these sarim that were there to, to torture these Israelites. So it's, it's such a strange thing to say. So why would you say that Moshe was not feared as a, as a taskmaster if he's the prince of Egypt? 
Hmm. What just happened in the last story? He killed an Egyptian. He killed an Egyptian, right? Did that have something to do with it? It's sort of like he's he's left his post. He's left his he's forfeited yes. his standing. Well, yesterday you were the prince of Egypt until you turned on your own kind. That's right. And I heard that you turned on your own kind. So you've obviously put down the crown. Now that you put down the crown, now you're a nobody. You're a nobody. The same Moshe that had just seen the power of God's existence in the world, talking about the sacredness of every human being, now finds himself on the short end of the stick. He's a human being who now has no place to go. He's not an Egyptian. He's not in the palace. He's not even accepted by the Israelites. If he thought he was siding with the Israelites to stand up for them, they won't take him. So now how would you feel about this God that you say is the source of all sacredness of human life? What about me? What place do I have in the world? That's exactly where the Makalo ends up years later. We discussed earlier how Moshe and the Makalo shared a similar plight. But the truth is, when Moshe first goes out, he's psychologically dealing with a similar identity crisis as the Makalo. But practically, he still had a home. What Rabbi Foreman was pointing out now was how that changes when Moshe kills the Egyptian, how he actually loses his place in society. Even the Hebrew slaves make it clear that they know his secret and they aren't going to protect him. Now, he's not just struggling internally. He too, literally, practically, has no place in the world. Truly, just like the Mikhail. But though their stories align at this moment, They go in very different directions from here. And this was the last comparison between these stories that Rabbi Foreman wanted to show me. See, Moshe, he runs away at this point. He flees to Midian. But when he gets there, he has an encounter that totally changes his life. He gets recognized by the daughters of Yitro. The daughters of Yitra see him, and how do they identify him, ironically? As an Ish Mitzri. He's an Ish Mitzri. That's got to be pretty bitter to right. hear that. If he were, if pretty he were bitter. an Ish That's Mitzri, right. he'd have a palace, he'd have a future. But uh, to be identified right. as an... He turned his back on all of that. And then along comes Yitro, and Yitro says, invite the guy in. But interestingly, when he says, invite the guy in, Yitro doesn't address him as an Ish Mitzri. Yitro's language, va'ayo, lama azavten eta... Ish, why'd you leave the man behind? Almost as if Yitra is very happy to leave behind national affiliation. Just you're a guy, right? And then, Vayoel Moshe la Shevet et Ish. Moshe was very happy to be with this guy. Makes me think of um, the Prince of Egypt didn't have it so wrong. Their Yitro figure is very uh, yeah. kind of hippie. <laughs> this jovial person who can leave everything behind. And maybe at some level, right, that's the sense of it in the text, which is that Yitro just scoops him up and says, I don't care who you are. You don't have to be a prince of Egypt for me. You don't have to be a Hebrew for me. You just have to be an Ish. An Ish, a man, as opposed to an Ish Mitzri, an Egyptian man. And by the way, remember that term Ish Mitzri from last time? It's used to describe the Egyptian man Moshe kills, and over in Leviticus, the father of the Makalo. Add to that Yitro's daughters calling Moshe and Ish Mitzri here, and that's all three times this phrase is used in the entire Torah, which I think highlights what we were noticing, how significant it was that Yitro drops the word Mitzri and just refers to Moshe as an Ish, as a man. What a gift, what a godsend that Moshe stumbled upon a man like Yitro at this very moment in his life. Imagine if the Makalel had someone like Yitro who welcomed him at his lowest point. And this brings us back to the Medrash from last time. Why, we asked, did the Medrash spotlight Moshe as the one who ruled against the Makalel in that infamous court case? Maybe now we had an answer. Moshe was fortunate. Moshe had someone in his life that was there at the right moment, that could take him in, that could make him feel like he was a part of something, and the blasphemer didn't, which all goes to an understanding, perhaps, of what the sages are saying. When the sages say, where did the blasphemer leave from? He left from Moshe's court, having lost his case. 
It's almost like the sages are setting up Moshe as a bad guy. Look at what we know. We know that Moshe should have some sympathy with his plight because Moshe was in his plight. Moshe was in exactly his same shoes. It's almost as if Moshe is in the potential Yitro role right now. Moshe can just say, hey, you know, let's not talk about what identity you are, but I have a place over here. Come sit with me, hang out with me. It's almost like if you were to play a thought experiment, you would say, all right, according to the Medrash, Moshe had this court. And in that court, Moshe condemned this Mikalal. You know, what if there was another court? What if there was a court in heaven that was prosecuting Moshe for his behavior here and saying like, oh, one second, you missed something. You could have dealt with this guy differently. Who would be the prime witness? Who would you bring as a witness against Moshe? I would call to the stand Yitro. Here's this guy who was there for you, right? Let him testify of what you could do with somebody who feels dispossessed, how you could bring someone in. We'd come to Exodus hoping to make sense of the Medrash. And in a way, we had. At least we could now understand why the Medrash expected more from Moshe. But I don't know. I expected more from Moshe too. Am I allowed to say that? I, I was hoping that studying these parallels wouldn't just explain the Medrash, but redeem it. Like help us see a really good reason why Moshe was so cold towards the Makalo. And maybe even help us understand the moral of the whole Makalo story. But now, I think we've made all of our problems a lot worse, right? Like, the Mikhail is is extremely sympathetic. He's suffering from an identity crisis that Moshe suffered. And now we have this new question, which is, Moshe should have seen the struggle that the Mikhail went through and have identified and said, I remember this. I remember what it feels like to be on the outside. So, you know, put that together with the Medrash. How did Moshe not you know, find some way to bring this guy in the way Yitro brought him in, right? And so that we have questions on the Makala, we've got questions on, on Moshe, and I think most of all, we've got questions on God, right? They turn to ask God what to do here, and God says, stone him. All those questions have been made stronger by our journey to the past in Moshe's life. What really is the moral of the story? Yeah, Yimu, again, I go back to what I said before. There's a moral of the story ultimately for what it means to be Moshe, for what it means to be the blasphemer, for what it means to be God. And all of those figures are different, right? And the moral of the story may be that this is a catastrophic story that at some level went wrong in many ways, right? But sometimes what you learn from a story that went wrong is how it can possibly go right, what, what right is supposed to be. But to really get there, I think, having seen the past of this story, we need to see the future of the story too, because this story doesn't end here. There's an epilogue to it, centuries later. Forgotten about the epilogue. Rabbi Foreman mentioned it last time. So it seemed I just had to be patient. Everything would come together when we got to insert mystery epilogue here. Would it clear Moshe's name? Would it justify the Makalel's death? I really was as in the dark as you are about its identity and just as eager to get to it. But between sessions, I kept thinking about this cryptic line that Rabbi Foreman had said. Right, and the moral of the story may be that this is a catastrophic story that at some level went wrong in many ways, right? But sometimes what you learn from a story that went wrong is how it can possibly go right. It seemed like a warning. Don't expect the Torah's message to come wrapped in a bow. This epic trilogy may not end on a happy note. In fact, it may contain catastrophe. So would the epilogue really resolve our issues? Or like Exodus, just make them worse? We'll find out together next time. A Book Like No Other is recorded by Rabbi David Foreman and me, Imu Shalev. Our producer is Tikva Hecht. Our managing producer is Adina Blaustein. Audio editing for this episode was done by Hilary Gutman. A Book Like No Other is a product of Aleph Beta and made possible through the very generous support of Shari and Nathan Lindenbaum. Thank you, Shari and Nathan. And thank you all for listening.